Welcome to today's Walk Through the Bible by Category. We have six categories with one chapter each. This will take us through the Bible in less than nine months. Our first category begins with a reading from the Torah, God's Law Through Moses. Numbers 20. And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month. And the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there, and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord! Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them, and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord, as he commanded him. Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. These are the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord, and through them he showed himself holy. Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel, You know all the hardship that we have met, how our fathers went down to Egypt, and we lived in Egypt a long time. And the Egyptians dealt harshly with us and our fathers. And when we cried to the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out of Egypt. And here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your territory. Please, let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or vineyard or drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. But Edom said to him, You shall not pass through, lest I come out with the sword against you. And the people of Israel said to him, we will go up by the highway, and if we drink of your water, I and my livestock, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. But he said, You shall not pass through. And Edom came out against them with a large army and with a strong force. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory. So Israel turned away from him. And they journeyed from Kadesh. And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came to Mount Or. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron at Mount Or, on the border of the land of Edom, Let Aaron be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land that I have given to the people of Israel, because you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. Take Aaron and Eleazar his son, and bring them up to Mount Or, and strip Aaron of his garments, and put them on Eleazar his son. And Aaron shall be gathered to his people, and shall die there. Moses did as the Lord commanded, and they went up Mount Or in the sight of all the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments, and put them on Eleazar his son. And Aaron died there, on the top of the mountain. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain, and when all the congregation saw that Aaron had perished, all the house of Israel wept for Aaron thirty days. Our second chapter is from Israel's history. Second Kings 11. 
Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal family. But Jehoshabah, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being put to death. And she put him and his nurse in a bedroom. Thus they hid him from Athaliah, so that he was not put to death. And he remained with her six years, hidden in the house of the Lord, while Athaliah reigned over the land. But in the seventh year Jehoiada sent and brought the captains of the Karites and of the guards, and had them come to him in the house of the Lord. And he made a covenant with them, and put them under oath in the house of the Lord. And he showed them the king's son. And he commanded them, This is the thing you shall do. One third of you, those who come off duty on the Sabbath, and guard the king's house, another third being at the gate, sir, and a third at the gate behind the guards, shall guard the palace. And the two divisions of you, which come on duty in force on the Sabbath, and guard the house of the Lord on behalf of the king, shall surround the king, each with his weapons in his hand. And whoever approaches the ranks is to be put to death. Be with the king when he goes out and when he comes in. The captains did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded, and they each brought his men who were to go off duty on the Sabbath with those who were to come on duty on the Sabbath, and came to Jehoiada the priest. And the priest gave to the captains the spears and shields that had been King David's, which were in the house of the Lord. And the guards stood, every man with his weapons in his hand, from the south side of the house to the north side of the house, around the altar, and the house on behalf of the king. Then he brought out the king's son, and put the crown on him, and gave him the testimony. And they proclaimed him king, and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and said, Long live the king. When Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she went into the house of the Lord to the people. And when she looked, there was the king standing by the pillar, according to the custom, and the captains and the trumpeters beside the king, and all the people of the land rejoicing and blowing trumpets. And Athaliah tore her clothes, and cried, Treason! Treason! Then Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains who were set over the army, Bring her out between the ranks, and put to death with the sword anyone who follows her. But the priest said, Let her not be put to death in the house of the Lord. So they laid hands on her, and she went through the horse's entrance to the king's house, and there she was put to death. And Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and people, that they should be the Lord's people, and also between the king and the people. Then all the people of the land went to the house of Baal, and tore down his altars and his images. They broke in pieces, and they killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And the priest posted watchmen over the house of the Lord, they took the captains, the Karites, the guards, and all the people of the land, and they brought the king down from the house of the Lord, marching through the gate of the guards to the king's house. And he took his seat on the throne of the kings. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet after Athaliah had been put to death with the sword at the king's house. Jehoash was seven years old when he began to reign. Our third chapter is from Israel's prophets. Ezekiel 14. Then certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, these men have taken their idols into their hearts and set the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? Therefore speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Any one of the house of Israel who takes his idols into his heart and sets the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and yet comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him as he comes with the multitude of his idols, that I may lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel, who are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent and turn away from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For any one of the house of Israel, or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel, 
who separates himself from me, taking his idols into his heart, and putting the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and yet comes to a prophet to consult me through him, I the Lord will answer him myself, and I will set my face against that man. I will make him a sign and a byword, and cut him off from the midst of my people, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet is deceived and speaks a word, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. And they shall bear their punishment. The punishment of the prophet and the punishment of the inquirer shall be alike, that the house of Israel may no more go astray from me, nor defile themselves any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people and I may be their God, declares the Lord God. And the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, when a land sins against me by acting faithlessly, and I stretch out my hand against it and break its supply of bread and send famine upon it and cut off from it man and beast, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they would deliver but their own lives by their righteousness, declares the Lord God. If I cause wild beasts to pass through the land, and they ravage it, and it be made desolate, so that no one may pass through because of the beasts, even if these three men were in it, as I live, declares the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters. They alone would be delivered, but the land would be desolate. Or if I bring a sword upon that land and say, Let a sword pass through the land, and I cut off from it man and beast. Though these three men were in it as I live, declares the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they alone would be delivered. Or if I send a pestilence into that land, and pour out my wrath upon it with blood, to cut off from it man and beast, even if Noah Daniel and Job were in it. As I live, declares the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver but their own lives by their righteousness. For thus says the Lord God, How much more when I send upon Jerusalem my four disastrous acts of judgment, sword, famine, wild beasts, and pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. But behold, some survivors will be left in it, sons and daughters who will be brought out. Behold, when they come out to you, and you see their ways and their deeds, you will be consoled for the disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem, for all that I have brought upon it. They will console you when you see their ways and their deeds, and you shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, declares the Lord God. Our fourth chapter is from Israel's Wisdom and Poetry. Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as at Meribah, as on the day at Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said, They are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Our fifth chapter is from the Gospels. You have completed all four Gospels. Our final chapter for today is from the church epistles or letters. 1 Peter 4 Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. The time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, 
passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Good morning and welcome to Morning Prayers Day 17. Today's subject is Radical Faith. You might be surprised to find out that all legitimate believers must, in the end, have only radical faith. None of us will get very far in this life of faith without a sold-out kind of faith that, in the end, will even be radical to you. Surprisingly enough, the truth about radical faith is that you don't produce it yourself. The Holy Spirit produces it. He's the author and finisher of our faith. You can't conjure it up. You can't create it out of thin air. You can't repeat it like a mantra and make it happen. The only thing you can do is seek the Lord with all your heart and fill your soul up with the words of God from Scripture. The Bible says we are born again by the Word of God. This mixture of Scripture and you is the most potent, life-giving, joy-creating, and faith-filling force in the universe. Think of a pitcher of water. And if you had a vial of red dye, and you took one drop of the red dye and you put it into the water, it would turn the water a little tiny bit pinkish looking probably if you put a little bit of dye in. But if you took the whole vial and you poured it into the water, immediately the whole pitcher of water would become red and it would be filled. That is exactly what happens to us when we mix the Word of God into our life. God has made human beings to be empty without the Word of God. And yet, if you take the Word of God and you pour it in, in large doses into a human being, it totally changes the character and the look of that human being. This is exactly what radical faith does. The creation of radical faith can be understood this way. It's like watching your kids play ball. Let's say you take your children to uh, play some sports at the local school. And while you watch, to your surprise, your child actually makes the winning score and the whole team wins because of what your child just did. 
you sit back and glow in the moment, wondering how your kid had it in them to lead their team to the winning score. You know you had nothing to do with it, but you will be taking all the credit for the rest of the night because after all, it was your kid that did it. Watching the Lord create complete trust and obedience in your life is radical. And the only thing you have to do is present yourself to him so that he can blow your mind and turn your faith into something that even shocks you when you see it in practice. You will not ever imagine that you could have as much faith as you're having when you pour the word of God into your life. Without this radical faith, it is going to be impossible to please God. Whatever doubts that we may have, these are the weeds in our soil that must be plucked up by the roots. Our faith is not in temporary outcomes and only in those prayers that God has answered swiftly and with yeses to. Our faith in Him must be rooted in confidence in his word, in his promises, and in his ability to bring us through this life, working out all the details of our salvation perfectly in this imperfect and chaotic world. O oh Lord, give us radical biblical faith, for there just isn't any other kind. Now let's get to our scriptures for today. First we look at a story from the book of Daniel, and this is about radical faith. This is about faith that these gentlemen probably did not even know was in them to the degree that it was. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, the officials, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue that he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted out, People of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed to the ground and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Long live the king! You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon, and they pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. And when they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, that's the key. Their faith was radical because they were determined that God was real even to the point of death and that they could not do this against him even if he did nothing to save them. 
that is radical faith. Even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads were singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angels to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make this decree, if any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other god who can rescue like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. What a fantastic story about radical faith. And here's the truth. If any of us would have been there and we were legitimate children of God as we should be right now, we would have done the same thing because radical faith is created in people and God knew that they were going to face this issue and God prepared them and made them that faith. That's the part and the point of the message tonight. That's what I hope you gather from the rest of the scriptures that I read to you. Now let's turn to Proverbs for a quick look at what it says. The wicked run away when no one is chasing them, but the godly are as bold as lions. Jesus said in Matthew, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And then the author of Hebrews tells us, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It is by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that it rewards those who sincerely seek him. Look at that one verse. It says that you've got to believe that God exists. That's your contribution to the faith. And that you, because you believe that God exists, you will be sincerely seeking him the reward is going to be that God is going to create in you radical faith, saving faith, and of course, all the rewards that come from faith. 
And then it continues. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about the things that had never happened before, speaking of the rain and the floods. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land that God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. In other words, Abraham had an eternal perspective, and his faith rested upon that. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead, a nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to count them. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised but saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. It means they did not receive all that God promised in this life. And this is interesting because this is exactly how God designed faith. It is that you get sort of a down payment in this life. You'll see some things come to pass, but you will see most of it in the life to come. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on the earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. Speaking of the future and eternal life. If they had longed for the country that they came from, they would have gone back, but they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac. Even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessings for the future to his sons, Jacob and Esau. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. He even commanded them to take his bones with them when they left. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt. Not fearing the king's anger, he kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came trashing down. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, received what God had promised them. They shut the mouth of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from the dead. And then it takes a turn here in the scripture. It talks about those who didn't get to see the glory of 
instant salvation and rescue from God. But look how the radical faith never changes. Watch this. This is in verse 35. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. There it is. That's where radical faith is coming from. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And finally, while Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. My brothers and sisters, remember this. You do have to have radical faith, but you can't create it. Only God can. All you need to do is expose yourself to the Word of God and believe that God exists and that He rewards those who diligently seek Him. Diligently seek God through His Word, and this radical faith will happen to you. And if you're ever put into these positions to where God wants to do a miracle for all to see, you'll have the faith. If He wants to take you and make you someone who is one who doesn't receive the promise but goes on into eternity and then receives it, you'll be fine with that too because you serve the Lord. You trust in Him no matter what outcomes there are. Let me end this with the priestly blessing. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you His favor and give you peace. Amen.